Good morning, pro-lifers. It is so good to be here with you all today. And in, can I say, can I call this weather beautiful? I think compared to January weather, it's pretty darn beautiful. So no winter coats. What do you all think? <laughs> My name is Mary Kate Zander. I'm the executive director of Illinois Right to Life. Um, it is such a pleasure for us to be involved in this event. This is one of my personal favorite events of the year. Every year, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to gather with pro-lifers from all across the state, and not just the state, from all across the Midwest here in Springfield. So give yourself a round of applause. Thank you so much for being here. So we have an awesome lineup of speakers ahead for you, leaders from all corners of Illinois' pro-life movement, and my hope is that you come away today with a renewed vigor for defending life, not just in our state, but in your home communities where it is so, so important for you to be engaged. Um, here to kick us off with prayer is a man who needs no introduction. Bishop Thomas Paprocki is a true leader, not just in Illinois pro -life, in the Illinois pro-life movement, but a true leader in the defense of life in the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and beyond. Please give our beloved bishop of the Springfield Diocese, Bishop Paprocki, a warm welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. As Bishop of Springfield, I want to welcome you here to our state capitol. And uh, thank you for your presence and being a uh, part of this day of giving witness uh, to the sanctity of uh, human life. And we do that in a number of ways. We do that by our presence. We do that by our speech and uh, the signs we have. We do that by our marching and making our views known. We do that through our lobbying of the uh, state legislators and uh, of our government officials. But most of all, we do it through prayer. That's the most important uh, weapon that we have in our arsenal to protect life. And so uh, our Catholic community just celebrated uh, mass at the University of Illinois at Springfield, and uh, we had a nice crowd there. Some of them, I think, are still coming here, but I want to thank you for, for being part of that. And so um, in our prayer this morning, as we or this afternoon, as we begin this March for Life, basically we want to pray for, for four things. We give thanks to God, pray for forgiveness, pray for conversion, and pray for strength. So let us pray. Dear God, we praise you for all your greatness. We thank you, our creator, for the gift of life and for sharing that life and your love with us. And we ask you to help us to share the gift of life and love with others. We come to you, therefore, first of all, with hearts full of thanks. We thank you for this gift of life. We thank you for bringing all of us into the world. We thank you for the respect that we have for human life and for the, the sense that we have in our hearts of trying to protect human life. We also come to ask for forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness for all those who have had an abortion. We ask forgiveness upon those who promote abortion. We know that when our Lord was crucified, he said to his persecutors, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I wish we could say that here. Perhaps there are people that are, are taking human life, unborn life, don't know what they're doing, but unfortunately, too many do know precisely what they're doing. They know what they're taking human life, but they're doing it for political or economic benefit. And so we must pray for their conversion, pray for conversion of their hearts, that they may come to see the sanctity of human life, to the, to the life of the unborn child from the moment of conception all the way through natural death. And so we ask you for your grace to help us to be strong, to give witness to life, that we do this in a peaceful way, but with the, the powerful witness of our presence, our words, and our actions to bring greater respect for all human life. And so all of these things that we pray to you for, Lord, today, our prayers of thanks, our prayers asking forgiveness and mercy, our prayers of conversion, and our prayers asking you to give us strength in our witness. We ask all this only possible through your grace. And so we ask for your grace to be given to us and shower us and help us. We ask all this in your honor and glory for you are God who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.
At this time, I'd like to invite the Crusaders for Life to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and we dignify students to sing the national anthem. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare. Bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free? Our next speakers are Christy Hofferber and Dr. Mary Keene. Christy is a pro-life and adoption advocate who shares a message about the value of all life. She was conceived through unimaginable circumstances and speaks about how the gift of adoption spared her life, bringing tremendous joy to her adoptive family and later healing for her biological mother. After learning this at age 30, Christy was compelled to help others and left a 10-year career to go back to school to obtain her master's degree in social work. Christy is now the CEO of a Beacon of Light Pregnancy Help Center in Maryville, Illinois, and a pro-life speaker whose message is grounded in faith and love. Christy speaks to God's ability to take imaginable, unimaginable situations to bring glory for his purpose. After we hear from Christy, Dr. Mary Keene is going to share with us about the issue of physician-assisted suicide. She is board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, pediatrics, and neurodevelopmental disabilities. She attended Northwestern University Medical School and completed her residency in pediatrics at Loyola University Medical Center. Dr. Keene has been named a top doctor by Chicago Magazine, Consumers Checkbook's Top Doctors, and Best Doctors in America by Best Doctors, Inc., as well as a Patient's Choice Award winner. Dr. Keene approaches each of her patients with patience and love, seeing Christ in each person God places in her path. Please join me in welcoming these ladies to the podium. Good afternoon. What a great turnout today. It's by the grace of God that I'm standing here with you today because my birth mother courageously chose life in an uncertain unthinkable situation. She hid her pregnancy, placing me for adoption at birth. She ultimately saved my life not once, but twice. As you heard in my introduction, I was born in less than ideal circumstances. I was conceived in rape and incest. I'm the only surviving sibling of six between my biological mother and her own father. My birth mother endured many years of abuse, including a miscarriage from physical violence and four forced abortions to cover up his actions. 
I'm not an exception, as many people will claim. I'm a human being just like each of you. Did you know that many who are pro-life will make an exception for rape and incest? The number is actually staggering at over 60%. Today, I want to provide you with two reasons not to hold exceptions. The first reason, there are two victims. Both are innocent, both have immeasurable value, and both deserve to be protected. My birth mother was not protected. Access to abortion allowed my birth mother's abuser, her own father, to continue the abuse for over 20 years. Abortion didn't provide her with freedom, as many claim. It stole her childhood, it destroyed her children, and it allowed her to be victimized over and over again. The second reason I would encourage you not to hold exceptions. All life has value, right? All life has value. I want to share with you a simple example to give you a better visual understanding. If you have two pennies, one that's brand new, one that's worn, tattered, um, dirty, what's the value of each of those pennies? It's the same, right? The same value. So why would we not look at life differently? Each life holds immeasurable value, no matter the circumstances of conception. In closing, as we continue to advocate and work to save unborn lives, remember those who are like me, deemed an exception. We too are worth saving. We are worth fighting for because we are all created in the image of God, each and every one of us. So today I ask you to march for all lives without exception. Thank you. As a pro-life community, we have been coming to marches for decades to call attention to the value of each and every human life, born and unborn. Much of the attention given to our work focuses on legal protection for pre-born babies and their moms. But as a physician who works primarily with patients with disabilities, I want to remind you all about another vulnerable group of individuals who are also under threat. Just like pre-born babies, my patients are often considered devoid of value. Some say that because they can't do everything that healthy people can do, or because they suffer more from pain or discomfort, their lives don't have as much meaning. People with disabilities, including illnesses like depression, are often ignored or neglected or considered unimportant or a burden to their families and society. I have seen this attitude present itself in a number of different ways towards people like my patients. For example, people with disabilities often live with limited access to health care, to transportation, to employment, to education, and even food and housing. And now, the Illinois General Assembly is sending them the message that they might just be better off dead. As the General Assembly moves ahead with assisted suicide legislation, some of our elected representatives talk about doctor-assisted death as if it were freedom. However, people with disabilities recognize that placing assisted suicide alongside a list of other options for those who are sick or elderly or disabled creates a pressure to make a choice to avoid being a burden and will allow the state of Illinois to ignore their real needs. Did you know that the state of Illinois ranks 47 out of 50 states in funding and care for people with disabilities? Imagine yourself in this scenario. Your family is struggling to pay for food, or pay the rent, or pay for gas for the car, and you just found out you have a serious illness. You certainly don't want medical bills stacking up. 
While you are waiting for a decision from your insurance company about the more expensive choice of, say, chemotherapy, your insurance company may quickly offer you their preferred choice, the cheapest choice, of pills to cause death rather than restore health. We must protect vulnerable individuals from unscrupulous insurance companies and health care plans. We need to protect people with disabilities from legislation which will make them vulnerable to unfair pressures toward unwanted choices. And we must insist that our legislators remove our state from the bottom of the list of shame of states that don't offer sufficient support to people with disabilities. Do not let the Illinois General Assembly tell my patients, you are better off dead. We must insist that all people, including people with disabilities, be treated with dignity and respect. Thank you. In light of Dr. Keene's words, I thought I would just give a quick update on the physician-assisted suicide bill that we have um, here in the Capitol. Um, so I'm sure many of you are wondering about the status of, they call it the End of Life Options Act. We love that they love to make this about choice, right? Um, the physician-assisted suicide bill that is currently in play is in a subcommittee in the Senate Executive Committee. Um, its deadline has been extended, and we anticipate that they will continue to extend that deadline through May, um, which we know what tends to happen at the end of May. So I would encourage you all to continue to reach out to your legislators. Um, continue to educate yourselves on this bill. We have a really great informational resource on our website, IllinoisRightToLifeAction.org. Um, we encourage you to take those talking points and bring them to your senator and your representative. Next, I'd like to introduce Julie Garofalo and Savannah Tucker. Julie is the executive director of Waterleaf Pregnancy Resource Center. She has been active in the pro-life movement for 40 years and felt specifically called to Waterleaf shortly after its founding in 2009. Julie began her Waterleaf journey as a volunteer when she joined the original marketing committee before rising through the ranks to the role of executive director. Being the executive director of such an important ministry is the calling of a lifetime, and Julie believes God has prepared her for this role through her long career in business and education and her vocation as a parent. Savannah Tucker is the president of We Dignify at the University of Illinois, where she is a senior. We are so grateful for her pro-life leadership on her college campus. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Julie and Savannah. Wow, this is awesome. Good afternoon. Pro-life for every woman with every child. This year's March for Life theme perfectly reflects the collective mission of your Illinois Pregnancy Centers. Regardless of our unique characteristics, every single center serves women, saves lives, and touches souls. Waterleaf is located in Aurora, directly adjacent to a mega Planned Parenthood. Since 2009, we have served 9,000 individuals from over 425 cities in 41 states, Puerto Rico, and Canada. In 2023 alone, we provided virtual pregnancy loss support to women from six of the world's seven continents. We have confirmed the birth of 2,200 babies. Now multiply these numbers by the nearly 100 pregnancy centers in Illinois, and you can imagine the impact that we have. While the numbers can be impressive, we never forget that we serve individuals, not statistics. Women and men with unique, compelling stories, facing challenging circumstances, and struggling with life and death decisions. She is the high school sophomore athlete who, despite intense pressure from her boyfriend, chose life. She is the young high school student whose counselor sent her to Planned Parenthood, who gave her an abortion pill, who told her to go to the emergency room say she was having a miscarriage, and then tell her they had no capacity to serve her needs when she had a traumatic event. She is the woman who buries her own desire to be a mom to make everyone else happy. She is the mom of three whose husband threatened to leave if she had the baby. 
They are the young migrant couple, couple who, after five failed visits to Planned Parenthood for an abortion, chose life after seeing their 20-week-old child on a pregnancy center ultrasound. He is the dad who wanted to parent but was denied that opportunity. They are the three sets of twins born to women who took the first abortion pill, changed their minds, and sought out abortion pill reversal services. She is the young mother of three under the age of two who is struggling after the loss of her partner to a massive heart attack. She is the heartbroken woman who, with little support, terminated her pregnancy and is now struggling with massive grief and suicidal thoughts. It is your Illinois Pregnancy Centers who effectively serve these women and men day after day. We are effective because we minister with love, compassion, and truth without judgment, because we use research-based protocols to assure there is no deception or coercion in our marketing or in our services, because our licensed medical providers conduct themselves with professionalism and integrity, because we offer exceptional care at no cost to our patients, saving the taxpayers of Illinois millions of dollars each year. Ultimately, we are effective because we honor life, and we are here to pick up the pieces of our patients', patients complicated lives, giving them hope and confidence. Thank you. Today, we honor the women and men in Illinois who devote themselves to this difficult yet critical work. We can't do it all, but we do what we can. We do it well and with confidence, allowing the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. This is God's work, and we are called, just as you were called here today, to boldly proclaim the sanctity of all life and to protect it with all we have. Please join me in thanking my colleagues across Illinois as they faithfully serve women, save lives, and touch souls. At 14, I embraced the lies of our culture. Engrossed in promiscu promiscuous behavior, I took plan B with no hesitation. Society taught that this was a fast solution to a potential problem. At 17, I thought I could be pregnant. I wanted to be a mom in the future, but didn't think it was going to happen at that point. When I told my partner, he said, I'll pay for you to get an abortion. I pushed back, saying that I would want to keep it. Oh, no, you're not, he said with a laugh. I was not kidding, but I was frustrated and disappointed that he was. This was the world around me. You see, I was a proud, radical, pro-choice feminist. I fought with pro-life friends about abortion. I didn't believe you could be pro-life and compassionate. Society taught that being compassionate meant letting everyone do whatever they wanted and that I needed to exercise my right to do what I wanted to be empowered. But society told me I could not be empowered and be a mother. That changed when I saw the truth. Starvation, grasping and pulling, tearing apart. This is what I saw in a video about what abortion procedures do to children inside of their own mothers, the women I fought so hard for. I became pro-life the day I saw that video. Abortion wasn't the pro-choice compassion I advocated for. It was gruesome, and I wanted to convince my pro-choice friends too, but I didn't know how. That's when I joined a We Dignify small group. We Dignify taught me how to change hearts while still speaking the truth. Because of the tools and education I received from We Dignify, I'm now confident when I speak for life. In speaking for life, I've had the opportunity to change an international student's heart by moving them from pro-choice until birth to seeing that the child is alive inside of the womb. And today, I'm inviting you into this mission with me because you can change hearts too, but you must be willing to speak for life.
I have chosen. <laughs> I have chosen to sacrifice a lot for this ministry. In one month from now, I will be continuing my sacrifice by working full time as a pro life missionary. <laughs> Me. <laughs> the girl who would have been screaming at you from the corner. The 14-year-old girl who took the morning after pill without any hesitation. The 17-year-old whose partner would have pressured her into an abortion had she been pregnant. That was me. But that's not where I am anymore because pro-life people invested in me. The only way to change hearts, to change our culture, is to walk with women and speak up for life. If you want to build a culture of life, you'll have to join me in sacrificing. Join me in sharing the truth and beauty of life by speaking to your pro-choice friends and family, lobbying today after the march, or by donating to a pro-life organization. I have hope that together we can be the change. Some of you are probably aware that, ooh, let's see if we can get this up a little bit. Some of you are probably aware that Governor Pritzker allocated $23 million to abortion programs across the state of Illinois since Roe v. Wade was overturned. Yeah. And one of the reasons that he did this is he wanted to make the business environment for Illinois, uh, in Illinois for abortion providers as palatable as possible. He wanted them to feel welcome here. Um, and one of the communities that has been uh, victimized as a result of this, 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 these policies um, is the University of Illinois. There is a, a new abortion clinic as of the last year that is just a few miles from campus, and it's an abortion provider from Ohio who brought his business into Illinois, um, not because uh, he couldn't go somewhere else, but because Illinois is just that attractive to, to perform abortions here in our state. So that is why work for, uh, from organizations like We Dignify is so important, and I encourage you to stay updated with what they're doing because they are doing incredible work on campuses to encourage students to choose life when they do find themselves in unplanned pregnancies. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Felicia Pricenor. Felicia is the Vice President of Government Affairs for the March the March for Life, where she brings the collective voice of pro-life America to Capitol Hill and to state capitals across the country, including those who participate in the March for Life. She advocates in defense of the voiceless, seeking protections for the unborn. Prior to joining the March for Life, Felicia was the associate director for the Virginia Catholic Conference. Prior to that, she was in private law practice, but left it behind when she felt called to fight against the ultimate injustice of abortion, advocating for those who cannot advocate for themselves. Please join me in welcoming Felicia to the podium. Hello, pro-life Illinois. Woo! I think we could do a little better than that. Let's let them hear us in there. Our, our members are in there, so let, let them hear us. Come on, one more time. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yes, that's a little better. We'll, we'll pick it up later. <laughs> we are so excited to see thousands of you here today marching for life in Springfield and incredibly grateful for the years of dedication to marching in Illinois, not just here, but in Chicago too. In post row America, the power to protect the unborn has been returned to each and every one of us through our elected officials, both at the state and federal level. It is critical that we march at the Capitol, letting our legislators know we are here and we will not stop marching until every woman and every child is protected in Illinois. We all play a critical role in advocating for life. My journey actually started on a day just like today. 
I marched with my mother every year in Washington, D.C. at the National March. And for those of you that have been, that's no easy task. She'd push me in the stroller through the freezing rain and snow and sleet, but it instilled in me the sense of justice that led me here today. I saw the love, the compassion, the joy that exudes in the pro-life movement. We care and love both mom and baby. Our hope today is that this march instills in you that same mission to help put an end to abortion in Illinois. Woo! <laughs> Our March for Life theme this year is with every woman for every child. This reflects the co compassion and love that embodies the pro-life movement. For decades, pro-life organizations have cared for women and families in need, especially in moments of crisis. Across this great country, over 3,000 pregnancy resource centers and maternity homes have been empowering women to choose life, helping them overcome fear, poverty, addiction, through providing them the resources that they need. Every one of you today has something critical and irreplaceable to contribute, contribute to the fight for life. If you haven't already, I highly encourage you to meet with your General Assembly members today. Call on them to protect life. I also challenge you to volunteer at your PRC, PRC centers if you aren't already. Every one, of, every one of your voice matters in advocating for life. In fact, you have an opportunity right now to let the Illinois General Assembly members hear your voice it, over that train, hopefully. Um, <laughs> so we need them to stop HB 4867 from passing. It's a bill that forces all of us to accept abortion as a human right in Illinois. Abortion, which ends a human life. HB 4867 would force small private business owners and PRCs across the state to accommodate women who are seeking abortions or face legal action for making decisions based on their core beliefs and pro-life beliefs. Abortion rights have no place as part of Illinois' human rights protections. <laughs> All of us here today should have the right to compassionately and freely protect life. Do not let HB 4867 take this fundamental right away. So here's good, what I'm going to ask each and every one of you to do today. Like I said, you have an opportunity to let them know that we oppose making an abortion a human right in Illinois. So if you could pull your cell phone out right now. And if you could hold it up for me so I see that you actually pulled it out. Okay. All right, keep them coming. It's not cold out, so our hands are warm. You can pull, <laughs> pull out your phones. All right, now this is critically important. Now text I-L-M-A-R-C-H to 73075. And as you see, we have the signs here on either side of me on the stage. Text I-L-MARCH to 7305. And you can, in one click, send an email to your legislators letting them know that you support life, you support babies, and to protect PRCs. Let us all leave here today energized and motivated to spread the message of hope, love, and compassion that defines the pro-life movement. Let us not stop until every woman and every child, born and unborn, is cherished and protected. I'd like to offer a special note of gratitude towards our wonderful partner um, for the Illinois March for Life, Mary Kate Zander and Illinois Right to Life, as well as the woo, yes, <laughs> as well as all the dedicated pro-life advocates and organizations who helped make today such a beautiful and successful day. So thank you again, Jane Kuya, for all my Polish friends in the crowd uh, for being here today. Now let's march. <laughs> thank you, Felicia. Um, so additionally, I want to make sure you all are aware, um, who here has filed a witness slip? 
That is a lot of hands, but that's not nearly enough hands. Um, so, but that's great. That's good. We uh, witness slips are one of the really important ways that we make sure that our voices are not just heard, but actually recorded um, at the state level here in Illinois. Um, so when we have bad legislation that we don't like, we have the opportunity to put our opinion about it on the record for the committees that are hearing that, uh, hearing that bill. And so that's a witness slip. And Illinois Rights to Life Action, one of the things that we do to serve you all and make sure that all of you are tapped into what's going on here in Springfield, we make a point to send those witness slip links out when those opportunities arise because the window is typically very small um, for you to fill out those witness slips. So one of the ways to get on that list to make sure that you have the opportunity to file your witness slip and get your opinion on the record on this bad legislation uh, is by texting this number. So I'm going to repeat it for you one more time. It's IL March, M A R C H, and you text that to 73075. That's 73075. Um, so once again, this is something that will continue to serve all of us as a pro-life community moving forward as we lobby at the state level. Um, now I'm thrilled to introduce to you House Republican Leader Representative Tony McCombie. She is a passionate advocate for life, and she worked incredibly hard here in Illinois to fight the repeal of parental notification back in 2022. I'm sure many of you have heard me say that it is hard to be pro-life in Illinois. I know that's not a surprise or a secret. That's why legislators, party leadership in particular, who are willing to really hold the line on the hard issues are so valuable to us and deeply cherished by our movement. We are so grateful to Leader McCombie for her work and for her staunch pro-life advocacy in the State House. Please join me in welcoming Leader McCombie and the rest of the Republican uh, pro-lifers to the table. Put them up, everybody! Put them up! I love seeing all the signs! We are, we are in session right now. Otherwise, this would be a lot more crowded behind me, so please give them grace. Hello and uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to Springfield. My name is, my name is Tony McCombie. I represent the 89th district, uh, which is in Northwest Illinois. Uh, my first term as leader, but my eighth year in Springfield fighting for the unborn. This is a really great crowd. They wanted to limit you today to silence you. But here we are, all here, standing united for the unborn. Your voices are vital and it is essential for you to be vocal on important issues to you, especially this one, advocating for women and children. Many are obsessed, fixated on keeping the issue alive, but not keeping children alive. Children in the womb should be cherished and loved, not exploited for politics. Once upon a time, abortions were to be limited, safe, legal, and rare, they said. Today, the extremists don't even pretend. They're not ashamed to say no restrictions. Illinois Democrats have passed and allow abortions up to the moment of birth, eliminating, eliminating parental notification. Take Taking parents and guardians out of the process, giving counsel and support when it is needed the most, and to top it off, putting you taxpayers on the hook to pay for it. Illinois is one of the greatest states in the nation. The essence of our state should be a beacon of growth and economic opportunity not a beacon for mortality and abortion destination. We need to unite and fight together against radical activist agendas. Together, we can build strong families through good resources like jobs, 
education, and faith. I am here to, t to thank you for telling the story that doesn't always get told. Parents who are involved with their children, healthy family structures, people who lift up and support women and children. I want to thank you. Let's amplify the voice of the, those who support life. Please continue the prayers for the unborn, and please pray. Please pray for the Illinois Democrats who have such agendas that ignite and divide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leader McCombie, and thank you to the pro-life minority members who stood alongside the leader today. I'm going to read their names so you can listen for your legislator, and if they're not here, well, maybe that you should call them when you leave here. Um, Representative Dan Calkins, Representative, let's, can we hold applause till the end, just because there's so many, which is great. We love that. Um, Representative Dan Calkins, Representative Adam Niemerg, Representative Chris Miller, Representative Marty McLaughlin, Representative Jed Davis, Representative Blaine Willauer, Representative Brad Holbrook, Representative Charlie Meyer, Representative Dave Severin, Senator Wynn Stoller, Representative Travis Weaver, Senator Neil Anderson, Representative Bradley Fritz, Representative Bill Howder, Representative Kevin Schmidt, Representative Amy Ellick, Representative Tom Weber, Representative David Fries, Representative John Cabello, Senator Sally Turner, Representative Amy Grant, and Representative Dan Swanson. Thank you so much to our legislators who are here today. And it pleases me so much to introduce our next speaker, Senator Terry Bryant, who is truly one of our fiercest advocates that we have in Springfield. Senator Bryant has a perfect pro-life voting record, opposing the repeal of parental notification, the use of taxpayer dollars to pay for abortion for undocumented immigrants, and all of the many bills that have targeted pregnancy resource centers over the years. I could go on and on. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Senator Bryant. Thank you. Thank you for those really kind words. It's, um, it's not just a pleasure to be here today. It's an honor uh, to be here today. And I would say to each of you, um, we're not here just uh, as legislators. We're here as your brothers and sisters. We're here uh, not only as your brothers and sisters in faith, but uh, uh, fellow citizens of Illinois. So when we, um, when we cast votes, we're not just casting them uh, for a small section of Illinois. We're casting them for all of the pro-life movement, and we're proud to be able to do that. Now, uh, I was a little conflicted about what I wanted to talk to you about today, because I'm going to talk to you a little bit about government. But then I'm also a mother and a grandmother, so I want to talk to you a little bit about that very quickly. Um, you know, every 10 years, they redraw the maps, and until this cycle, I represented a portion of a town that I love very much, Carbondale. I no longer have Carbondale in my district, but it is where I go to church, so it's near and dear to my heart. Just about a year and a half ago, there were multiple articles, one in particular that was titled, How a Small Illinois Town Became the Abortion Hub of America. Carbondale, Illinois, right now, in the deep south, where often it's just assumed that we are bright red and very conservative, three abortion clinics in Carbondale. Now, I'm, I'm, quoted, I'm quoted in that article as a pro-lifer. There's another individual who's quoted in there. I don't, I don't know necessarily that I would call her on the other side, but certainly her quote indicates that. And she asked me at one point, I said, gosh, I bet you weren't very happy about being quoted in that way. And she said, no. Don't we want economic development in Southern Illinois? Economic development. The answer is yes, I want economic development, but I don't want the death of the unborn to be the way we get it. 
as a as a legislator, I can tell you that often we have to try to find ways to move the ball forward. I think um, sometimes you know we beat each other up in the pro-life movement if a bill doesn't go as far as we want it to go to come back in the other direction. Sometimes we have to take that incrementally. I have a, multiple bills. One of them I want to talk to you about today uh, is Senate Bill 3746, and it's the Ultrasound Opportunity Act. For those of us who have a lot of pro-choice friends, this is actually a bill we can talk to them about uh, in a very good way in that, do you believe in, do they believe in giving a woman a choice or not? This bill says that if an ultrasound is performed, the woman must be given the right to see the ultrasound. Because at Planned Parenthood facilities, they're prohibited from seeing that because Planned Parenthood says that that picture that ultrasound is proprietary to them. It's not proprietary to them, it's proprietary to the woman who should be allowed to see that ultrasound. Why don't they want her to see it? They don't want her to see it because we know 75% of the time when that woman sees her baby, she's not going to kill her baby. Now, the challenge for we and the pro-life movement is this, and that is to remember that our task is to show people love. Over 300 times in scripture, the word love is used, depending on which translation you use. Uh, in the Gospel of John, it's mentioned over 50 times, and then again in 1 John. The reason for that is that love moves a multitude of issues, but it also opens the floodgates of heaven, and it allows the Holy Spirit to move in the hearts of people. And the death of babies is not going to be stopped by legislation. It's going to be so solved and stopped by the hearts of people. And that takes Holy Spirit intervention. So very quickly, I want to tell you this. When I talk about that love, everybody standing up here would tell you they've probably been pro-life almost all of their lives. I can go back as far as I can remember and say that that's the case for me. And that's all well and good until the first time you're confronted with it personally. So my kids were taught to be pro-life. My grandkids are being taught to be pro-life because we love life from conception to natural death. But just a few years back, almost 10 now, for the first time in my life, I was personally confronted with the issue. My 28-year-old daughter, who went to Bible college, um, we were sitting at Mother's Day, on Mother's Day in the center of Red Lobster in my first campaign, which was really awful anyway. My husband's sitting at the end of the table with our two granddaughters, her daughters. She's going through a divorce and has begun to date a new young man. Mom, what do you think about him? Well, honey, I don't know. I've only met him a couple of times. She started crying. Well, I'm... Sometimes I'm considered hard-hearted Hannah when it comes to saying to my kids, buck up, right? Let's get on with this. We don't have time for this crying and stuff. So she asks me again, what do you think of him? I said, honey, I don't know. We only met him a couple times. My husband's down there coloring with the girls. Finally, I said, what is your problem? And she said, I'm pregnant. And she was pregnant with the new young man's baby. In my head, and moms who are here, and dads probably too, you know we don't always handle everything perfectly. As we get older, I think we get a little better at it. So in my head, I'm thinking, I only get one chance to do this right. Don't mess this up. And I said to her, well, first my husband said, what did she say? I said, she said she's pregnant. He went back to coloring. I said, well, Tara, just tell me that you're going to keep the baby. Now, it turned out to be twins. We didn't know that then. And she said, well, of course I'm going to keep the baby. And my answer to her then was, the rest is just logistics. How do we make this work? Now, folks, I'm telling you that very personal story because I want you to hear me when I say this. We have to express love. These individuals are in crisis. They're hurting. 
They don't know what to do, and the world has told them to get rid of that baby. But that is not what the Lord tells us to do. We cannot, as legislators, do what you're asking us to do without your help. So we're here today to ask you for help in supporting us when we come to the table to make sure that your voices are heard. You're going to have to do it by putting your money where your mouth is. Not to us, because I can't ask that on state property. But to those crisis pregnancy centers, if you want women to have a choice, then let them have the ability to have that choice from our perspective. And that choice is to keep that baby. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for the love that you are showing. Continue that love to those who are in crisis and to those unborn babies. We appreciate you. God bless you, and thank you for letting us come to you today. How's everybody doing? Guys, before you leave, you ready to make some noise? Give me an L. Let's give our pro-life legislators one more round of applause. We're so glad that they're here. All right, so really quick, we have two more speakers that we're gonna bring up here, but we're gonna take a quick pause. We want a photo of the crowd. So we're gonna do two things. First, I want you all to hold your signs in the air as high as you possibly can. If you don't have a sign after this, there's a table of signs right over here on my, on my left-hand side. Um, so you're going to hold your signs high in the air, maybe this from people, we're going to bring them down just a little so we can see everyone else behind you, perfect. Um, and then what we're going to do is on the count of three, we're going to say, we're here for life. And I want to hear you so loud, I want this building to shake. One, two, three, we're here for life. Thank you all. <laughs> awesome, thank you guys. Okay. All right, um, I'm so excited to bring to you our headlining speaker today. Uh, Lauren Mazika is, uh, I'm sorry, frog in my throat. Lauren Mazika is president and CEO of Sidewalk Advocates for Life, the nation's largest sidewalk outreach program. She is a licensed attorney whose passion for defending the sanctity of human life led her into the pro-life movement. She has over 20 years of sidewalk outreach experience, including participating in the very first 40 Days for Life campaign and later serving as 40 Days for Life's campaign strategist, advising their 300 plus campaigns in North America. Inspired by the transformative power of prayer and peaceful outreach on the sidewalk, Lauren founded Sidewalk Advocates for Life in 2014. Let's give Lauren a round of applause. Okay, well, where I come from, this is how we start. Repeat after me, howdy. Well, hello, Illinois and friends of the Midwest. My name is Laura Musica. I'm a pro-life attorney, a trained sidewalk advocate of 23 years, and I serve as president and CEO of Sidewalk Advocates for Life. As Mary Kate said, it's the largest sidewalk counseling organization in the nation. We train, equip, and support people like you who have a heart to go to the darkest places in their communities, the local abortion or abortion referral facility, and offer mothers in crisis loving, life-affirming alternatives. And in the 10 years that we've been on the sidewalk, we've grown to over 282 locations 
in, in the United States, Puerto Rico, Mexico City, and Colombia, and we've wit witnessed more than 22,000 mothers choose life for their precious pre-born children simply because people like you said yes to this great mission. Friends, the Holy Spirit prompted me to come all the way from the great state of Texas to bring you a message of hope. First, that's right. I love it, love you guys. First, I wanna say thank you for helping to overturn Roe versus Wade. Let's give God a hand on that, right? And here's why I can say that. Because law follows culture, and culture is the hearts of the people. And as you have chosen to pray, stand up, show up, advocate and educate, you have helped to transform culture. You helped to make a Supreme Court decision like this possible. The courts are a microcosm of the culture. Isn't that true? Therefore, you were the yes to God that ushered in this miracle that people said for decades would never happen. And yet here we are on the other side of that miracle. Can we give God a hand on that? Still, I don't need to tell you that we have work to do. We've got dangerous, unregulated, mail-order, abortion-causing drugs being shipped to women from Mexico and India. We've got an administration hell-bent on turning our corner pharmacies into abortion pill dispensaries with seemingly no concern about DIY abortions at home or the trauma that comes inevitably with the chemical abortion regimen. We've got Planned Parenthood's plan to deploy abortion vans to our state borders, dispensing the abortion pill with the hope to soon do surgical abortions aboard a bus. We've got, that's right, we've got a predatory abortion industry flooding into cities, often small cities at our state borders and pro-abortion states, turning many salt of the earth communities into abortion destinations or abortion tourist areas. And we've got about 14 states, praise God, that protect life and we've got about 36 to go, including Illinois. We're making progress. But knowing this, some of you may understandably be frustrated. You may be thinking, how could my state, how could the great state of Illinois be among those that allows abortion in just about every case that seemingly has no regard for the beauty and the dignity of every human life? And I'll respond to that question by sharing with you what came to me as I was praying for this state and praying for all of you. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Illinois, my message for you today is this. It is time to shine. It is time to be unafraid to share the pro-life, pro-love message with your friends and neighbors. To be unafraid to post that pro-life article, to wear that pro-life t-shirt, to speak up when the topic of abortion comes up, to talk about how we care for both baby and mother, to share with others that you were blessed and proud to be here marching for life today. Amen? That's right. And if you're tempted to ask, Lauren, how will those little things eventually make Illinois choose life? I admonish you to remember, hearts and minds are changed one conversation, one relationship at a time. Remember that law follows culture, and culture is the hearts of the people. And hearts and minds will not change if you don't keep praying, showing up, speaking up, advocating, and educating. So many former abortion workers like Abby Johnson are on our side now because someone like you didn't give up on them. We love Abby. 
So many women have chosen life because someone was unafraid to offer them help and a vision forward. So many abortion facilities are closed in pro-abortion states because people didn't stop going to pray and reaching out to those going in and offering them a different way. That is the magic of our yes. Regardless of what's going on in our state houses, regardless of our state law, you and I can talk to our friends and neighbors, or we can go to our local abortion facility to pray and to reach out to a mother in crisis and affect change. We can connect women with the local life-affirming pregnancy resource center, thereby saving the life of a child. And every time we do that, in a very real sense, abortion ends for that mom, for that child, for that community in that moment. And as hearts and minds change, eventually the law will change. The law has to change. That's right. We are seeing the beginning of the end of abortion because people believed, rightly so, that states become pro-life one person, one community at a time. Friends, I admonish you to remember, don't give up. Mothers in crisis need you. Preborn children need you. Broken and hurting families need you. I encourage you to rise up and respond to the call that God has placed in front of you to be salt and light to a world in need. And as we do, we will see post-Roe America gradually become an abortion-free America. Illinois, you are great, you are loved, and we are cheering you on. Keep going. God bless you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Okay, I feel that you all are ready to march. We're not quite there yet. Okay, we're going to close in prayer, and then there's going to be just a couple of housekeeping announcements, and then we're going to take off and go around the Capitol. So, really quick, um, well, last but certainly not least on our list of speakers, I'd like to bring to the podium Reverend Michael Moore, president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, Central Illinois District. <laughs> I, have been, I have been blessed to get to know Reverend Moore a little better in these past few weeks, and I have been both touched and inspired by his contagious enthusiasm for the March for Life. It was an honor to have him on our planning committee this year, and we are blessed to be led by him in today's closing prayer. Um, Reverend Moore, thank you. And I'm joined today also by uh, President Alan Buss of the Northern Illinois District and President Timothy Shar of the Southern Illinois District of our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And for those of you who are wondering, no, Lauren and I do not have the same stylist. Our God is a God of life. On the sixth day of creation, he breathed life into a lump of lifeless clay, declaring that this humanity is made in the very image of God. God affirms this gift of life as the image of God, as he gives mankind the command and privilege to participate in this act of creation, as we are sent to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. God confirmed this place of humanity as the image of God by becoming incarnate for us, God and man united in the person of Jesus Christ, born suffered, died, raised, and ascended for us. Just a few weeks of, ago, we in the Western Church celebrated, and in a few weeks, our brothers and sisters in the Eastern Church will celebrate this resurrection of our Lord, raised from death to declare that death has been swallowed up in victory. Death does not win. For God defends the life of those who bear his image, those who share their humanity with the incarnate Christ. God has instituted among us rulers, our legislators, our judges, our governors, and our administrators to see that the weak and the voiceless are defended and protected. 
we stand with every woman throughout her pregnancy, that motherhood may be protected. We speak for every child, that they may be protected from every threat to body and soul. We pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you have ordained and established civil authorities as instruments to bring about good within your creation. Embolden and strengthen your people as they speak truth to power, the truth of your word in how you have created us all with the inherent dignity that comes from your own image. Turn the hearts and the minds of the people of this land that we would all see the value of every life and regard each neighbor from the eldest to the youngest as your own precious child. This we ask and pray in the name of our incarnate and resurrected Lord, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. As you march, we encourage you to raise your voices for life. So, all right, I'm going to give you all a pro tip. I was a cheerleader in high school. You have to cheer from the diaphragm, okay? So we're going to practice, and then, and then we're going to continue to shout. We're going to continue to cheer as we begin to march, okay? All right, so I want you to say it with me. With every woman, for every child. With every woman, for every child. With every woman, for every child. Let's march! 